Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Flynn, and I am the National Senior Director of Engagement for the American Liver Foundation. The ALF is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. Since 1976, we have provided a voice for patients and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. Welcome to the first session of the Nurses Education Series, NAFLD, NASH, and Cirrhosis, presented by the Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council. This educational webinar was planned by nurses, for nurses, advanced practice nurses, and other healthcare professionals. The American Liver Foundation is grateful for its support that it received from Octopharma USA in support of this educational webinar. Dr. Trupti Mehta has joined us today and will share a few words about plasma safety for liver patients. Trupti, welcome. Thank you, Kathy, for the kind introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm very happy to provide a brief communication on the topic of plasma safety for patients with liver disease. Many of you are probably taking care of liver disease patients who can't make enough clotting factors, and these patients would rely on plasma transfusions to prevent or treat bleeding. So for hospitalized patients who require plasma or FFP from the blood bank, we should think about the transfusion-related risks, such as pathogen transmissions, transfusion-related acute lung injury, also called trolley, or allergic reactions. And this past year, the unprecedented COVID pandemic has definitely reminded us to take the steps necessary to protect the blood supply. Fortunately, there's very little risk of transfusion transmission for SARS-CoV-2, but this may not be the case for the next emerging infection. And we've seen this with previous outbreaks from mosquito-borne viruses, such as Zika. So ask about the safety of the blood supply at your institution. We now have the means to protect patients from existing and emerging blood-borne threats with virus-inactivated plasma or blood components. So I'll end by saying thank you for the opportunity to communicate this important message to this special group taking care of liver disease and liver transplantation patients who may require plasma therapy in the hospital. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Diane Lapointe Rudeau. Diane is a nurse practitioner from the Mount Sinai Hospital, and she's also a member of the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Council. Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kathy, and welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, I get to talk to you about Zoom etiquette. So um, this webinar is being delivered on the Zoom platform and many of you are familiar with that. However, just in case you're not, we're gonna give you a couple of tips. First of all, we are recording this session, so please be aware of that. Um, all attendees will receive a link to the video via email for on-demand viewing and sharing after we're done. To eliminate any background noise, um, only uh, the speakers and microphones, uh, of, only the speakers, microphones, and um, cameras will be enabled. So you will be muted. Um, for optimum view uh, viewing, we ask that you um, look at the top right hand uh, part of your screen where it says view and put your um, video into the speaker view so that you can only see the speaker and the slides. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on the chat feature. Then simply type your question in the chat box and we hope we can get to all of your questions at the end of the presentations. Um, and so today, we are really lucky to have three experts to speak to us um, at this nursing education program. Um, and then we're going to have a question and answer period at the end where all the panelists will stay on and answer your questions. The three topics for today are what is NAFL and NASH? 
And we're lucky to have Alyssa Sajays here, um, and she's a nurse practitioner at the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation at the Weill Cornell Medical Center. And she is a member of the American Liver Foundation, Greater New York and New Jersey Advisory Council. Um, after Alyssa is done, we will um, hear about the management and treatment of fatty liver disease, exercise, diet, and nutrition. And we are lucky to have Danielle Staubs here to talk about that. Um, she is a clinical dietitian at the Center for Advanced Digestive Care at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center. And then finally, we will have a talk about the progression of fatty liver disease, NASH, and cirrhosis. And Dr. Sunal Kumar will be here to speak about that. Dr. Kumar is a hepatologist and the director of clinical hepatology at Weill Cornell Medical College and is a member of the American Liver Foundation, Greater New York and New Jersey Advisory Council. Please remember that you may enter your questions for the speakers in the chat feature at any point during the presentations, um, and that the speakers though will, will speak to the questions at the very end. Um, and so finally, it is my pleasure to turn over the program to our first speaker, and we're gonna have Alyssa Sajay's um, address non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Alyssa, we'll see your slides. Thank you, Diane. As Diane said, my name is Alyssa. I'm a nurse practitioner here at Cornell in the Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation, and I will be doing an overview of NAFLD and NASH. So to start with the textbook definitions, NAFLD is what we call fatty liver. It's diagnosed in the presence of hepatic steatosis seen on imaging or by biopsy and in the absence of other causes of liver disease. NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, a subcategory of NAFLD, and it's essentially inflammatory fatty liver. On biopsy, you'd see the characteristic findings in the parentheses below. The incidence and prevalence of NAFLD and NASH. The incidence is not quite well known. There is very little data throughout the world. There are a few studies, um, and it's estimated maybe about 12 to 13% of people will develop it over the three to five years. Prevalence has a little more data. It's estimated about 25% worldwide, though does vary by geographic area. It was historically relatively overlooked and under-addressed, so the numbers are becoming more apparent now as we are addressing it and acknowledging it. And it's also rising in the current obesity epidemic. And then below I write that the data can be affected by many factors, so this probably also has to do with why we didn't have little data up till recently. So for the pathophysiology of NAFLD, it's essentially a disturbance in the uptake of fat in the liver. The liver usually carries about 5% or less fat. However, in the presence of circulating free fatty acids in the bloodstream, it will uptake more. Free fatty acids come from three main sources, adipose tissue, dietary fats, and de novo lipogenesis. And in dysfunctional adipose tissue, it may not take up more free fatty acids if it's at capacity, thereby increasing the amount in the bloodstream. Also, in the presence of insulin resistance, adipose tissue releases more free fatty acids into the bloodstream, and insulin resistance also increases de novo lipogenesis during a fasting state. So all of these contribute to the liver taking up more fat than it usually would. On the right, you can see biopsy slides, um, fat is seen as those white bubbles. The pink reddish tissue is normal liver tissue. We have three grades for steatosis, and you can see as the, the biopsy slides go down, uh, you can see that the fatty amount increases by those white circles. The pathophysiology of NASH is the inflammatory fatty liver. So how I describe it to patients is basically um, this that fat causes inflammation and irritation. Inflammation and irritation causes damage and damage over time causes scar tissue. And it's not just a one-time insult when it's NASH, it's over and over. So the scar tissue accumulates over time. And again, I put biopsy slides on here to show that. These are trichrome stained biopsy slides and the red areas are the normal liver tissue. The blue areas are the fibrosis. And we have four stages of fibrosis. 
And you can see as you move along that there are more and more areas of blue and it becomes more expanded and takes up more of the normal liver tissue. F4 is cirrhosis. So that is a large amount of scar tissue that can cause a disruption in the function of the liver. So to diagnose fatty liver, the presentation's asymptomatic. Most of the time you won't have someone come to you and say, my stomach hurts, I think I have fatty liver. But in your workup for that stomach pain, you may find on the imaging that it's noted that they also have a fatty liver or in the blood test that you may do or regular routine blood tests, you may see that their liver tests are abnormal. I note the ALT levels there by our AASLD guidelines, the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, because those are the guidelines that we use to see what's normal for our patients. But if you know, on regular lab tests, the range is a little higher than these numbers. So what may come back as seemingly normal on a regular blood test may not actually be normal for that person. So we take that into consideration when we're assessing patients. There are no biologic markers for NAFLD. Um, as I said on the first slide, it's a diagnosis of exclusion made in the absence of other liver disease. General population screening is not recommended. Instead, what's recommended is attempting to identify high-risk patients which as you may have guessed from the pathophysiology slides all have to do with metabolic factors listed here. There is a category of lean NAFLD, which is fatty liver in a non-obese, non-overweight person. So they wouldn't have those risk factors that you'd be looking for, but they could still have fatty liver. And I have a footnote that ALT can be, can be an unreliable marker of liver steatosis and inflammation Though we do generally see that liver tests are mildly abnormal in someone with steatosis, um, whether it's NAFLD or NASH, but they can be normal in those people too. So in the workup, first anyone with elevated liver enzymes should have a full workup with abdominal imaging and checking for other causes of liver disease, as well as getting a good thorough history of any illnesses, medications, supplements, and alcohol, as all of those can cause liver enzymes elevated as well. Most of the time when someone's found to have fatty liver on imaging or elevated liver tests, they get referred to a specialist. So this is the workup that we would do for them when we see them. On the right, I have the chart of uh, similar to the biopsy slides, just a description of the grading and staging that we do and the percentages of fat by each grade of estimation of fat um, and the severity of fibrosis. With fibrosis, you can begin to have an idea of how much a person has by non-invasive testing. Um, FIB4, Afri, and Fibroshore are blood tests. Fibroscan and MRE are types of imaging. Most non-invasive tests are better for deciding that a person does not have advanced disease rather than staging early uh, fibrosis and disease. NASH requires a liver biopsy for diagnosis. So that would tell us also if someone has early disease, if they were biopsy. Liver biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis of all liver disease, but NASH can only be diagnosed from a liver biopsy. And it is still unknown who is at risk for NASH with fibrosis progression. It's a big area of research, but it isn't quite clear who may progress to having an inflammatory fatty liver and fibrosis. So we approach all patients with fatty liver from a preventative standpoint of wanting to prevent them from having NASH or having any fibrosis progression, even if they seem to only have a fatty liver with no inflammation. And which brings us to treatment. Uh, the treatment for fatty liver is healthy lifestyle habits, exercise, diet, and weight loss, as well as improving metabolic parameters such as diabetes and hyperlipidemia. There are no FDA approved medications. There is a big area of research for that, but nothing's approved yet. The graphic that I have here has the investigational medications on the right. Some are still in research, some have been discontinued. Um, nothing's there yet, but there is hope. With knowing that the metabolic parameters are the biggest risk for fatty liver and their biggest um, thing to address, it makes sense that cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of death in patients with NAFLD and not liver-related disease. With that in mind, that gives it more importance to treat those metabolic parameters like diabetes and hyperlipidemia. And so in that sense, it is good to remember that statins are okay in fatty liver and in fact can help it, um, as are diabetic medications to get someone's blood sugar under control. That's what the rest of this graphic has. 
um, some of the instructions and considerations for people with diabetes, with fibrosis, diabetes without, um, non-diabetic. There's a lot there, but essentially it's treat the metabolic parameters, healthy lifestyle. All of this Danielle will talk about too, so she'll get into it. But these are the most important things that we tell our patients when we're treating them for NAFLD. And with that, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Alyssa. That was wonderful and very informative. Um, I'm now going to welcome uh, Danielle to come and uh, give her talk, and we'll switch to Danielle's slides. Make sure you put any um, questions you have for Alyssa in the chat box. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. And um, today we'll be talking about nutrition therapy for NAFLD. So we'll jump right in. So we know that the major established risk factors for NAFLD include obesity, insulin resistance, and dyslipidemia, which are hallmark features of the metabolic syndrome. And the primary approach to treating NAFLD focuses on the control of these underlying risk factors. And diet and exercise interventions remain as the first line of therapy. Weight loss is considered to be the primary endpoint in treating NAFLD, um, and it's recommended to include comprehensive lifestyle modification over six to 12 months with calorie restriction of at least 500 per day. Um, sometimes, you know, depending on the patient, they might need much more than that. Um, as well as exercise interventions as well. With a small 5% weight loss, we can see improvements in steatosis and NAFLD activity score. We can also see clinically um, important improvement in things such as hemoglobin A1C and triglycerides. With a 10% weight loss or more, we can see a near universal NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement by at least one stage. So it's important to educate the patient on specific weight loss goals and their uh, suggested rate of weight loss. Usually this will be anywhere from one to two pounds per week in order for it to be a sustained uh, change. About 3% of the population who have NAFLD are not actually overweight. And so these are our lean fatty liver patients. So with these patients, the focus is more on healthy lifestyle changes and increasing exercise. If it's a patient who has a low BMI, then the focus would be more on weight training rather than on cardiovascular exercise. So there are certain dietary factors that increase a patient's risk of developing NAFLD. And this includes a Western pattern of eating that is low in dietary fiber from whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and legumes, low in omega-3 fatty acids, high in saturated fats from red meats, fried foods, and dairy, high in fructose from added sugars and sweetened beverages, and high in processed foods. And this is a great diagram that shows the pathogenesis of how certain dietary patterns can lead to more fat accumulation and NAFLD progression. So you can see here how a higher intake of simple sugars um, from fructose can lead to an increase in de novo lipogenesis or conversion of fructose to triglycerides. Fructose is a monosaccharide and it's found in concentrated forms in fruit juices. It's also found in high fructose corn syrup, which is the primary sweetener used in soda and other processed foods. Um, fructose is also a component of sucrose, which is table sugar, which is used in many confectionaries, baked goods, and also other sweetened beverages. Um, saturated fats and trans fats can lead to an increase in hepatic fatty acid uptake. And high content of sodium, presence of preservatives, additives, and trans fats can lead to more insulin resistance and dysregulated lipolysis. Um, you can also see here how there are certain protective features, dietary features, um, such as high intake of monounsaturated fats and omega-3s, more vegetable proteins, and prebiotic fibers. Um, and these are all hallmarks of a Mediterranean-style diet. So characteristics of a Mediterranean style diet have been shown to decrease some of the underlying risk factors of NAFLD, such as cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and type two diabetes, and seems to be particularly attractive for its potential role to improve liver status and reduce hepatic steatosis. 
So this is really the, you know, recommended pattern of eating that we, um, you know, tell our patients to follow. So a Mediterranean style diet is one that includes many plant-based foods, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, all of which are very rich in phytonutrients and have many antioxidant properties. Olive oil is considered to be the principal fat. It includes a variety of minimally processed and seasonal foods. It includes a moderate consumption of sustainable fish and poultry, really favoring fish. Red meat is limited to a few times per month, and it's recommended to avoid processed meats. Um, processed meats are also considered to be a carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Eggs are recommended in moderation, and fresh fruit would be used as dessert in place of simple sugars. So just speaking a bit more um, in terms of dietary carbohydrates and added sugars, we know that NAFL patients have been found to consume more sweets and simple carbohydrates. There's a 61% increased risk of NAFL in daily consumers of sugar sweetened beverages compared to non-consumers. And that's actually irrespective of obesity. So this is a really great place to start with patients if they're consuming any sweetened beverages to try to have them replace that with naturally sugar-free beverages, just having more water. A higher carbohydrate intake with more than 54% of calories has been shown, um, has been associated with significantly higher odds of liver inflammation and hypocaloric diets that are moderately lower in carbohydrates with about 40% uh, of calories coming from carbs has been shown to decrease serum ALT concentrations to a greater degree than a higher carb, low fat diet. So we do encourage our patients to cut down on their total carbohydrates and really try to focus on more whole grains. In terms of the added sugar limits, the American Heart Association sets limits for men and women. Uh, for men, it's recommended to have no more than 36 grams of added sugar per day. And for women, we get a little bit less, no more than 25 grams of added sugar per day. And just to show you how that quickly that adds up, in one 16 ounce bottle of soda, there is 55 grams of sugar, all of which is added, and the source of sugar is from high fructose corn syrup. So just in one you know, bottle of soda, you're exceeding the amount that you should be limiting it to in one day. So many patients just aren't educated on how to read food labels and really understanding where these sources of sugar come into their diet. So this is a really important intervention point. So we know that um, dietary fiber is a key component to a healthy diet and a healthy microbiome. And fiber may be protective for NAFLD, and a Mediterranean style diet is generally high in fiber due to the consumption of many plant-based foods. We know that fiber feeds the gut microbiome, it acts as a prebiotic, and it promotes the growth of healthy bacteria. Soluble fibers specifically are fermented to produce short chain fatty acids in the colon, which are more anti-inflammatory. Soluble fiber comes from foods such as oat bran, barley, nuts, seeds, beans, lentils, peas, and some fruits and vegetables. The goal for fiber is at least 25 to 30 grams per day. Most Americans are probably consuming half of that, um, maybe even a little bit less. And it's important to really eat a variety of fruits and vegetables weekly in order to improve bacterial diversity and just to get a variety of different phytonutrients. And um, this is an area that we spend a lot of time educating patients on. In terms of dietary fat recommendations, um, we encourage a diet that's high in mono and polyunsaturated fats. Monounsaturated fats come from foods such as olive oil, avocado, nuts, and seeds. Polyunsaturated fats, which are your omega-3s, come from fatty fish such as mackerel, salmon, sardines, trouts, walnuts, flax, and chia seeds, fish oil, we do not recommend cod liver oil because it is high in vitamin A, which can be hepatotoxic. Um, and of course, it's recommended to li limit the intake of saturated fats, which come from animal fats, fried foods, and processed oils. Um, even palm fruit oil, you know, is found in some natural peanut butters. So that's, you know, another area of education. Um, saturated fats also add up very quickly in, in the diet. Um, most Americans should be limiting their intake to no more than about 15 grams per day. And you can see here how um, on one package of, you know, butter, a tablespoon has already seven grams of saturated fat. So really trying to get patients over to more, um, you know, plant-based fats is a really great strategy. So just a word on coffee. Coffee with or without caffeine and its polyphenols have antioxidant and antifibrotic effects. 
Consumption of coffee with about two to three cups per day has been shown to reduce the risk of NAFLD. And there is an inverse relationship between coffee consumption and fibrosis risk amongst patients with NAFLD. So, um, you know, if a patient is coming in and they're a coffee drinker, we'll just educate them on reducing any added sugars or heavy cream that they're using in their coffee. Um, but we don't necessarily tell everyone to start, you know, drinking lots of coffee or espresso if they're not currently a coffee drinker. In terms of physical activity, exercise in addition to dietary intervention is the most effective treatment for NAFLD. Um, greater than 150 minutes per week has been shown to reduce the risk of NAFLD independent of weight loss. And it also can help with reducing that conversion of fructose to triglycerides. Both aerobic and anaerobic exercise are really um, the best methods and should be used in combination um, to achieve the best results. So RDs are really crucial in delivering uh, nutritional interventions in patients with NAFLD. We can individualize recommendations based on the patient's needs and preferences and really assess their stages of change. Treatment should include an interdisciplinary approach starting with the patient's physician and including the patient's nurse or nurse practitioner and dietitian. And I, I include here that support from the patient's doctor means everything. I'm lucky enough to get to work with Dr. Kumar, who you'll hear from momentarily. And she refers many of her patients over to see myself or one of my colleagues. And I think that the patient's always more motivated, you know, when they get the encouragement from their doctor to make lifestyle changes. And of course, close monitoring and follow-up is key. For many patients, they can lose weight initially, but keeping it off and maintaining it post a year is usually the hardest part. So in summary, we want to focus on a weight reduction of at least 5 to 10% of body weight. We want to reduce our added sugar intake, get patients reading food labels. We want to increase dietary fiber, add diversity. We want to reduce red meat and processed meats, incorporate more plant-based meals, increase physical activity, and follow up regularly. And that's all. I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Danielle. I have to say, I feel guilty. I'm sitting here eating candy and you're making me feel bad, but it was a great presentation. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions from Danielle, please uh, put them in the chat box. And um, we're gonna move on to our third presentation. This is the final presentation and Dr. Kumar will deliver it. And she's gonna explain the progression of fatty liver disease. Um, so NASH to cirrhosis. Um, welcome Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Just give me one second. All right. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about um, more about fatty liver disease, but really a focus more on the progression of disease to NASH, fibrosis, and then cirrhosis. Okay, so I um, always like to start off my fatty liver talks um, to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to understanding really what fatty liver disease is and how it's a disease spectrum. So on the left, you can see we have a normal liver here. Um, so this is normal, healthy, pink. Hopefully all of our livers look like this. Um, but then when someone gets fatty liver disease, the first step is to get steatosis. So steatosis, as you can see in the first picture there with the yellow liver, is just the development of fat droplets. So you can see all those little white bubbles. Alyssa showed a picture of this as well, but all those little white bubbles are just fat droplets amongst the normal healthy liver cells. But there's really not any inflammation there in the liver. It's just fat. But uh, And most people who have fatty liver disease actually stay in this category. They stay with just steatosis, don't really have any inflammation or any complications from it. But some people do progress. And about 15 to 25% of patients will actually develop what's called NASH or steato steatohepatitis. So you still see the steatosis. You can see the white little fat droplets. But on top of that, you also see inflammation and some hepatocyte ballooning. And that's when the first step of sort of declaring yourself a progressor when it comes to fatty liver disease. That's the first step in patients who are at risk for other complications. 
And then from that, you develop fibrosis. And again, Alyssa did a great job explaining this. Um, but people who have steatohepatitis over time are at risk for developing fibrosis. And about 15 to 25% will ultimately get cirrhosis. So obviously you don't go straight from steatohepatitis to cirrhosis, but you go through the stages. But over time, you have the risk of getting cirro uh, developing cirrhosis. And you can see on the, the liver all the way on the right, what happens in cirrhosis is that you get so much scarring that it becomes, you get these nodules. And so you can see the dark blue sort of bands or what is, what is fibrosis. And ultimately when it forms those nodules, that's considered cirrhosis. And the interesting thing is when once people develop cirrhosis, you don't really see that the steatosis or even the steatohepatitis. Actually, the normal liver cells in the pink ones look closer to the more like the normal liver than they do the steatosis. And this is what we call burned out NASH. Um, and so a lot of people who have burned out NASH or have cirrhosis that weren't known to actually have fatty liver to begin with often get termed cryptogenic cirrhosis. But over the years, we've really learned that the, a lot of people who have cryptogenic cirrhosis, meaning they probably presented with more advanced liver disease, probably had NASH to, or NAFL to begin with. And so once you get to cirrhosis, cirrhosis is also a disease spectrum. And a lot of these principles apply to any degree of cirrhosis, whether or any etiology of cirrhosis, whether it be NASH or, or hepatitis C, uh, whatever it may be. But the really the two big stages of cirrhosis are either compensated or decompensated. And when you're compensated, there are really no clinical complications. You wouldn't even know it. Most people are completely asymptomatic. ALT often normalizes, and as I mentioned before, you can get burned out NASH on biopsy. But then when you just develop complications, signs and symptoms of cirrhosis, such as variceal bleeding, encephalopathy, jaundice, ascites, that's when you're considered decompensated and you're at risk for disease progression to need either liver transplant or high risk of mortality. And NASH cirrhosis is the fastest growing indication for liver transplant. So it's a really big issue in the United States and globally. And no matter what stage or what, whether you're compensated or decompensated when it comes to cirrhosis, you're at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. And the risk is um, up to, you know, there are a lot of studies that have looked at this, but the risk is up to 15% in five years. So it's really important to monitor patients for, for hepatocellular carcinoma. So we talk a lot about steatosis and steatohepatitis and fibrosis and cirrhosis, but what really matters? What are we really talking about? What do we really care about when we see patients with fatty liver? And there have been a lot of studies that have looked at this. And what we, what we found over the years is that fibrosis is really the important part of evaluating someone with fatty liver disease. And that applies to not only um, liver-related outcomes, but all-cause mortality. This is one of the bigger studies that was performed, um, and it was published just a few years ago. They looked at over 600 patients with biopsy-proven fatty liver disease and matched them to controls and followed them for about 20 years. And what they found is that the risk of mortality really increases with fibrosis stage. Um, interestingly, there was no effect with the presence of absence or absence of NASH, but it really goes to show you that when we see a patient in clinic, we really what we really care about is where you are, not only on the disease spectrum, but on the fibrosis spectrum. And we really want to pick out those patients who have some degree of fibrosis. So what does that translate to in in uh, the United States in terms of numbers. We talk about the prevalence of fatty liver be disease being about 25% and then um, you know, 15 to 25% progressing to NASH and then 15 to 25% progressing to cirrhosis. Um, so in the United States, that amounts to about 83.1 million people with some degree of fatty liver disease. That means that they are somewhere on the disease spectrum 
spectrum, either simple steatosis, which again, of the 83 million, about 75% will stay in that category and not really have any complications. But what that means is that there's still 16.5 million people as of 2019 or 2015 that have NASH and with or without fibrosis, and then 3.3 million people with NASH and cirrhosis, and probably a lot of them undiagnosed. And this was uh, published back in 2018, but what the, the scary part of this study is that it, uh, they used Markov modeling to look at what's gonna happen as obesity and diabetes um, continue to rise in the United States. And although fatty liver disease overall is only expected to rise by 21%, that still amounts to almost 101 million people with some degree of fatty liver disease. And as patients get older, we're going to have more and more people with NASH with or without fibrosis, and that's 27 million people. And then almost 8 million people are predicted by 2030, which is not that far away, to have um, cirrhosis. And that will be 160% rise from 2015. And really, that is thought to be secondary to the rise in obesity and, uh, and diabetes in the United States. And that's this is going to occur worldwide as well because it's a it's a problem uh, internationally as well. So what do we want to do? Obviously, we can't treat as GI and liver providers. We can't treat all the patients, all 101 million patients in 2030 for fatty liver disease. And again, we know that the patients who are at highest risk of complications from fatty liver disease are those that have fibrosis, not necessarily the ones who have steatosis. Of course, we still want to do risk factor modification for those patients so that they don't progress down the road. But really, right here, right now, we want to pick out the patients who have a high risk of advanced fibrosis or fibrosis in general. So there are two ways of looking at it. You can look at patients for risk factors of fatty liver disease in general. And the common risk factors that we think of are obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, and PCOS. But those risk factors are not necessarily correlated with your degree of fibrosis, so not necessarily correlated with your clinical outcomes. Um, when we look at clinical outcomes, we really look at two big factors, and one is increasing age, and the other is type 2 diabetes. So not to say that everyone who's you know age over 60 or whatever your cutoff may be and has type 2 diabetes is going to have advanced fibrosis, but when someone comes into my clinic, and they maybe were referred from by their primary care doctor because they have elevated liver enzymes and fatty liver on ultrasound. If they're 30 something years old and don't have diabetes, I can be a little bit reassured that they probably don't have significant degrees of fibrosis. But again, this is just sort of rough clinical predictors. But we'd like to find something a little bit more comprehensive and a little more um, reliable than just clinical predictors. And again, Alyssa talked about um, non-invasive tests. And I like to, to separate non-invasive testing into two different categories. One are blood biomarkers or blood scoring systems. Um, and these often use just commonly used labs. And then the other is imaging. And I'll touch on that in just a second. So the, there are a lot of biomarkers out there or blood scoring systems out there. Some of them use labs that you can order in clinic, and some of them are send out where they have proprietary information about how they calculate whether a patient has advanced fibrosis or not. And when I, and just to backtrack a little bit, when I talk about advanced fibrosis, I really mean stage three and stage four, because if you think back to that graph where we looked at mortality in patients with fibrosis, the, the highest risk of mortality or highest risk of complications with the, were those patients with who, who have stage three and stage four disease. Um, so the most common ones that we use in clinical practice are the NAFLD fibrosis score and the FIB4 score. And so the FIB4 score is really an easy, um, easy score to use. It takes into account age, AST, ALT, and platelets. Um, and the NAFLD fibrosis score takes into account those four um, variables. And then on top of that, adds BMI, albumin, 
and the presence or absence of glucose intolerance or diabetes. And what these scores do, and these are online calculators, and if you have Epic, it's also, uh, or at Cornell, it's an Epic dot phrase, so you can easily calculate this. So um, it's a good, just easy way to sort of pick out those with advanced fibrosis. And these tests are not good at saying you have stage one disease, stage one fibrosis, stage two fibrosis, stage three fibrosis. That's not what these, these uh, scores are really used for. In order to do that, you really need a liver biopsy. But these, good, these scores are really good at picking out those patients who have either a high risk of advanced fibrosis or are in the low risk of advanced fibrosis category. So they give various cutoffs. So you calculate this score and then it spits out a number and whether you know you can see the, the cut high and low cutoffs. And yes, there is an indeterminate range, but um, you, know, you can get a good majority of patients into one of the categories of low probability of advanced fibrosis or high probability of advanced fibrosis. So when people come into our fatty liver clinic, everyone gets this score calculated. We use the FIB4 score because it's just an epic and much easier for us, but everyone gets a FIB4 score uh, uh, number so that automatically puts them into a category um, of either high probability or low probability. And then on top of that, there is there are imaging modalities that you can use to look to see who has advanced fibrosis and who doesn't. Um, we tend to use the fiber scan. Um, we have it in our clinic. Um, the fiber scan is like an ultrasound. It's really easy to use. All the patient has to do is really fast before for four hours before the test. Um, and you can see uh, this woman down here. She's getting her fiber scan done. Um, she probably does not have fatty liver. Um, but she, you know, it takes five minutes. It's done in the office. The problem is that the fiber skin can be falsely affected or, um, uh, you can get a high, a falsely elevated score if there's a lot of steatosis or inflammation and it's harder to do and a little more unreliable in patients with an elevated BMI. And of course, when we're talking about fatty liver disease, that's sort of an issue because most people have a lot of steatosis um, and have uh, elevated BMI. But for the most part, it's a good test. Um, you know, we combine our testing with the FIB4 score and the fiber scan. So we sort of have two modalities to look and try and select out patients um, with advanced fibrosis. A better test is the MR elastography. So the MR elastography is just a program that's used on a regular MRI machine. It doesn't require a special device, but the, the facility does have to have the software to do it. Um, and the MRI is great. It's, it is better than the fiber scan. The data behind it is a little bit stronger. And the good thing is it's not impacted by hepatic steatosis or inflammation and in BMI. Um, but the problem is it can be difficult to get insurance approval it costs a lot of money and a lot of patients just hate it. It takes a long time. You have to schedule an appointment. You don't get real time results. People get claustrophobic. So there are a lot of things to consider with MR, but we do some, you know, if you have two indeterminate results or two discordant results, like the FIB4 score doesn't match the fiber scan or it doesn't make sense clinically, sometimes we will result to an MR elastography to get more information. And then, of course, the, the gold standard for diagnosing both NASH and fibrosis is doing a liver biopsy. Um, we don't typically do that in the majority of patients unless we're concerned about something, um, but that's sort of always in the back, in your back pocket if you want to get a more definitive diagnosis and staging. So with that, well, what do we do? So I'm telling you, okay, we need to select out all these patients who have NASH and who have fibrosis or advanced fibrosis. Um, but on the flip side of it, um, there's no real treatment that we can offer them. Um, so there are no medications that are currently FDA approved. Uh, there are many clinical trials that currently are in progress. And the, most of these clinical trials have the endpoint endpoints of reversal of fibrosis with or without the resolution of NASH. And that just really speaks to how fibrosis is really the important marker when it comes to NASH. Um, that's really what the goal is, is to try and figure out um, who the patients are with advanced fibrosis, and then when a drug becomes approved to use that drug to reverse the fibrosis in hopes of improving clinical outcome. 
And, but until then, and even when, once we have uh, medications that are approved, um, a lot of it is just monitoring, especially for patients with advanced fibrosis. Um, you know, like I said, screening for liver cancer and making sure that liver function is intact. But a lot of it, a lot of it is also um, just lifestyle modifications. And this is where um, people like Danielle come into play um, because we work really hard at trying to get patients to work on things like diet and exercise. It's the first line treatment. We know that losing weight helps when it comes to liver disease and reversing fibrosis, reversing NASH. Um, and on top of that, it helps all the other comorbidities, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, all of those things will also improve with weight loss. So it's not just targeting, obviously it's not just targeting the fatty liver part of everything. It's really targeting the whole patient. You know, obviously this is a little bit harder because it's hard to lose weight. It's hard to be compliant with a strict diet um, and their, you know, sustainability is, is an issue. On top of that, there are some non-indicated pharmacological treatments. You know, we talk about weight loss being important in fatty liver disease and um, does it matter how you lose weight? Um, can you use weight loss medications and still get improvement in fatty liver and still get the reversal of fibrosis, even if, if, even if you use a medication? The answer is probably. Um, we don't know the answer to that um, but a lot of these drugs that are used for weight loss are being studied in fatty liver. Um, but if we use the, these in patients, we have to be very upfront with patients and say these are not FDA approved um, medications for weight loss uh, for fatty liver disease. And really, um, you have to weigh the risks and benefits because in patients with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, you also have to worry about the metabolism of some of, some of the medications and how it may impact the liver. Um, so I always have, you know, I, I don't use them very often, but when I do use them, I have a very open and honest discussion with the patient, um, you know, about the medications and the risks and benefits of it. So in summary, um, NAFLD is a disease spectrum, the progressive form of the disease NASH with fibrosis and ultimately cirrhosis only occurs in, the, in a small percentage of patients with, with the entire spectrum of disease. But if you look at the absolute numbers, um, it's actually really high, 3.3 million back in 2015. And, you know, those numbers are expected to rise. Um, but um, fibrosis is really the, the hallmark of, outcome, of clinical outcomes. So we really want to select out those patients with advanced fibrosis. Treatment still focuses on lifestyle modifications, but there are clinical trials underway that hopefully will serve as an adjunct to lifestyle modif modifications. And I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Those are such cute livers. <laughs> Um, so we're going to move over to our question and answer session, and we're going to ask all three of our experts to answer the questions that you have for them. So please um, put any questions you have for any of the speakers into the chat function, and, and I will um, moderate this part. Um, if we run out of time and don't answer all of your questions, then we will um, try to do it in an email um, within the next two days. Um, and so where do we start? There's so many things to ask. Um, I guess the first question is um, for Alyssa. Um, you know, you talked about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and, and the type of patient, you know, the obese patient with diabetes um, that, that typically comes to your office. But then you mentioned lean NAFL. Can you describe that? Like, are those genetic diseases? I mean, what, what makes somebody develop lean NAFLD? Well, I think I would start with the fact that we're defining it by BMI, which isn't the greatest um, indicator of someone's actual habitus. Um, we all know there's some issues with it. But in some people, it's truly that they are of okay or normal weight for themselves, and they just happen to have fat uptake in their liver. Um, we actually also can see it in, um, it seems to be more prevalent in Asian population where BMI is falling within the normal, so to speak, range, but they have fatty liver, which indicates that perhaps their metabolic parameters are a little different than other groups. Um, 
On the other hand, yes, there can be other reasons for um, the fatty liver in someone who otherwise had no risk factors. Medications can cause it, there are genetic diseases. So that would be considered secondary NAFLD. And in those cases, you would be addressing the cause of it to begin with. So if it's a medication, you would try to adjust or stop. Um, genetic, it would depend vastly, and there's very rare ones out there. So there may be nothing to do and more so just monitoring the person. Um, so lean NAFL can be a little harder, um, but it, it does exist. And, and like I said, I think the more common one we see is just people who happen to fall within a more normal range, so to speak, um, and ha may have some parameters to change in their life, but also may not. And then that would go to what Danielle said about um, focusing more on what lifestyle modifications there are, but weight, uh, muscle gain to help uptake that liver and change the insulin resistance and everything that might be happening um, at a lower level than those who we would expect to have NAFL. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Danielle. You spend a lot of time talking about fiber and the benefit of increasing fiber in the diet um, for somebody who has NAFL and um, how the Mediterranean diet is a good uh, way to do that. What if somebody doesn't really eat a lot of fiber doesn't enjoy those types of food would you recommend you know the fiber con the fiber tablets those little fiber gummies or do they have the same benefit or is it really fiber sources from food that they need that's a great question um so i think you know we always try to encourage fiber from food first and the reason for that is because fiber from foods you're also getting the benefit of all the other nutrients from that food um so there are so many different fiber containing foods out there that, you know, it doesn't just have to be, you know, within the category of various fruits and vegetables, whole grains. Usually we can at least work with the patient and find a few ways um, from a dietary standpoint to increase their amount. Um, but there definitely is a place for some fiber uh, supplements in terms of fiber supplements. Oftentimes they're really just, um, isolated forms of soluble fibers. And um, often, sometimes they're synthetic, sometimes they're more natural like psyllium. So it really depends on the patient if they have certain, you know, other GI, um, you know, issues that we might need to consider as well. Um, but absolutely, that could be a potential option for patients if they're unwilling or, you know, if they don't want to increase them from a dietary perspective. Got it. Um, and then for Dr. Kumar, um, you mentioned weight loss as an important way um, to help treat the patients. And, and you talked about sometimes you need to use certain medications on a case-by-case -case basis to encourage weight loss. What about bariatric surgery? I mean, is this something that you would encourage a patient to do? And is there a time where it's actually too late for them to go down the route of a surgical fix? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. Um, bariatric surgery, there's a little bit of data in bariatric surgery and fatty liver disease, and it does re reverse um, with the surgery. So I think, you know, if people meet criteria um, for bariatric surgery, I think it's a good option. The problem is that as you develop more advanced liver disease, bariatric surgery in itself or surgery in general becomes complicated and could potentially be high risk. So so patients who are, you know, borderline, you know, we, we think twice about it with patients who have cirrhosis or definitely if they're decompensated, we, you know, it's no longer an option. But even in cirrhosis, we think twice about bariatric surgery before we saying it's okay. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, you talked about incidence of, of NAFO and prevalence of NAFO and, and there's really not a lot of data about that. Um, do you think it's because this is a new disease? You know, we, we're predicting that it's growing. Is it that NAFL wasn't around many years ago? Is it the processed food in our diet? I mean, what do, what do you think the reasons for that are? There's many, um, but it isn't new. Uh, it actually was linked. It, it was found in the past many, many years ago. I forget the year, but not in this century for sure. Um, and it was even linked to diabetes in, I think like the 1930s or so, 50s, something like that, which means it's been known for a long time. I think often the medical community takes a long time to understand, identify and adapt. Um, so that in and of itself takes time for it to become a regular practice, but it 
was under identified um, and not known to be, um, as, as, as Dr. Kumar said, a lot of NASH turned into cryptogenic cirrhosis. So therefore it wasn't identified early on. Um, and so it was either, if it was seen, it wasn't seen as something harmful or wasn't even known to be acknowledged or found. Um, so I think that once enough attention is brought to it and once enough people catch on, then the numbers start to grow because now we're really identifying it. Of course, there's still other factors like accessing care, providers' knowledge still needs sometimes more to understand what we're looking for and what we're identifying and diagnosing and diagnosing properly. But I think the more attention we're paying to it, then we will get more accurate data on it to be able to say the incidence and prevalence with confidence. Thank you. Um, Danielle, um, there's a, a lot of talk in, you know, on Instagram and, and on TV about the benefits of the keto diet. Is this something that um, we can use with our patients with NAFO? Is this safe for people with liver disease? So that's a great question. And I get this a lot in my practice just because it is such a popular, um, you know, diet and is certainly all, all over social media. Um, so, you know, I, I find with the ketogenic diet, there are some clinical indications for it. There really has not been that much research in this particular area enough where I would feel comfortable recommending it as a, as a treatment option. And to be honest, when you're following a ketogenic diet, oftentimes you're eating a lot of dietary fat. And so it, it tends to, you know, in, in many cases, you're going to be eating, you know, more saturated fats in the diet. So from that perspective, it's not the best approach, but certainly, you know, significantly reducing a patient's carbohydrate intake or carbohydrate load and really trying to focus on more whole grains. I find that approach really helps with facilitating weight loss and also improving metabolic parameters. So that's the approach that I would recommend. We have time for one last question, and I'm going to give it to Dr. Kumar, to be fair, so everyone had two. Um, Dr. Kumar, um, are there any methods to prevent or reduce the development of HCC of liver cancer in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So I think, you know, HCC is always a, a concern in anyone with any type of liver disease. And um, unfortunately, there, if you have fatty liver disease, there's no real, outside of treating the fatty liver disease, outside of treating the underlying fibrosis, um, you know, those st the study that I quoted on mortality, there are other studies that have also looked at risk of HCC in fatty liver disease, and that still correlates with deg degree of fibrosis. So right now, outside, you know, weight loss, um, no, um, but it would just be really treating the underlying liver disease and focusing on lifestyle modifications. Well, thank you so much. Um, any of the questions that we haven't answered, again, we'll, we'll try to get to you within the next few days um, via email. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Diane. And I have to say thank you so very much to all of our expert speakers. Um, Nurse practitioner Alyssa Sajays, um, clinical dietitian Danielle Staub, and hepatologist Dr. Sonal Kumar. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise um, and your time with us during this webinar. Um, and obviously, I could not let this program end without thanking the um, team of accomplished nurses from the ALF's Greater New York and New Jersey Medical Advisory Council who helped plan the Nurses Education Series on today's webinar. So thank you to Margie fernandez Sloves, Deborah Gus, Diane lapointe Rudo, and Alyssa Sittes. Um, I want to remind everyone, all the attendees, that you will receive an email from us with a link to view this webinar on demand, as well as a program survey and an invitation to register for our future ses sessions of the Nurses Education Series. Um, our next session will take place in April, and the topic will be viral hepatitis B and C. For more information about fatty liver disease and other liver-related um, health topics, 
please visit the American Liver Foundation's website, liverfoundation.org. We also encourage you to share our website with your patients. Um, with the feedback we receive is that it is a great source of comfort when they're trying to learn about a new diagnosis or um, a progression uh, of, di of uh, liver disease. Um, and please, we welcome you to follow the American Liver Foundation on Facebook and YouTube. You can see that on the screen there. Um, a special thank you once again to our speakers and to Optopharma USA for their generosity in supporting the American Liver Foundation and seeing a lot of value in this nurse's education session. The program is now concluded. Um, we thank you for attending and we hope to see you all at session two in April. Thank you.